by my watch, and uh, we promised that we would get underway at 7, so that we could get everybody informed and back home in time for bed. So, um, I'd like to welcome you uh, this evening. I'm Brian Carpenter, the chair of the Newbury Select Board. And uh, this meeting is at the request of the Select Board and the community. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to see the number of community members that have come out because uh, we asked a lot of people to come here to answer our questions and um, allow us to plan and, and get a vision and understand what the next two years are going to be like. And so, um, I guess the first graphic is kind of what we're all driving towards. And, uh, well, I'm not going to give the uh, presentation. I want to just remind us of what our, uh, the goals and why we uh, have this project in the first place. Uh, first and foremost uh, is the safety of, of the community. Um, and uh, the way the project was designed was to maximize the vitality and keep the community going for the maximum amount of time with minimum disruption. Uh, we're working to, to maintain uh, the traffic flow. That will be something we'll talk about where those interruptions are and so that uh, people can start to anticipate, think about how that will impact their lives or their businesses and try to put a plan together for it. One of the things that we were struggle, struggling with early on in the project was the schedule and um, I'm here to say that we're and we'll cover that, but we're on schedule. And uh, we've built a credible schedule. This team that is working to support us and do the project um, has been, we've been working with them now for a number of years. We had a little pre-meeting yesterday, and I told Kathleen Ramsey, our town manager, as we were sitting listening on a teleconference, I could name every one of them, even the Federal Highway representative because the amount of communication that we've had in this project in the past couple of years, and I could tell who was on that, that phone call just by their, their voice and their presence. They hold themselves accountable, and they're not sending um, other people. And so um, our team, besides the town of Newbury, we have the Federal Highway Administration, um, VTrans, VHB, uh, we engineer on the project, and Cabrera Construction, who has been um, the contractor in charge of, of maintaining the, the timeline. So with that, I'm going to pass uh, the presentation over to John Griffin, um, the lead engineer for the project for the, uh, Vermont Transportation.
one uh, segment because a lot of your questions will be answered with the presentation. Okay? Thanks. You guys all hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, my name is Jonathan Griffin. I'm the project manager with VTrans for this project. Um, I'm going to step down here, and uh, if I trip and fall on these stairs, feel free to laugh at my expense. <laughs> so, general project overview. So, the project is 3,500 feet long, as you can see the diagram here. And you guys are all familiar with this being community members. Um, but the, the tunnel length is about 360 feet between Merchants Row and Main Street. And the construction total is up to about 6.1 meters. So here's a satellite imagery of the, the tunnel. As you can see, it starts by the tunnel lock and goes over by the post office. Um, and I'm going to breeze through this general information so we can get to the stuff that you guys really want to know about, which is how this is going to connect you. So a tunnel section, you guys have seen this before. Um, the road, merchants road, made sure you go over the tunnel. Um, and the railroad is going to go through the tunnel. And the bottom of the box, we've got stone in here. So the, the new tunnel is designed basically for 100 years. Um, and it's designed based on current codes and standards. And uh, we've got plan for the potential future uses of highway and uh, We try to accommodate as much as we could in the time of this structure. So current project status. You guys have all been familiar with early work package one, which was the temporary bridges. Early work package two, which was construction last season, which was the, uh, the drainage. Uh, and then this season, we, uh, this winter, we finished the project design and we're beginning uh, the main project construction. So uh, Kabricki actually got a contract today, so we're ready to go. And uh, federal funds and, and everything have been secured for this project, so we're, we're ready to go underway. 2018 recap. So in 2018, we installed the temporary access road um, to the Vital Block driveway. Um, so when construction access is occurring in that driveway, we can maintain access to those folks. Uh, the microtunneling for the drainage system, and we put a lot of the utilities underground so that they're out of the way of the cranes and all the overhead access that has to occur for the construction this season and the following season. And as many of you have seen, the tree cutting that occurred at the end of the last project, which was earlier this year. So the landscape looks dramatically different now. So speaking of uh, temporary access road and tree cutting, here's a good image of it here. And, uh, the drainage, the outfall. You all remember the giant hole that was in town here, which is now in the back of the launch shaft. Um, the, the tunnel to the outfall, the other tunnel to Triangle Park, and the other tunnel down to our works. And here's some uh, just photos recapping what occurred last construction season. So it was uh, pretty dramatic. Here's some photos of that, of that equipment for folks that might not have seen it. Sorry, I'll keep it up here. Thank you. So this is the tunnel board machine. This is what was used for the drives for the tunnel, the micro tunneling through through downtown uh, of last construction season. This is just a recap of what we've already done. We will get to what's coming up. The launch shaft and the tunneling machine, and then your community liaison at the first drive. <laughs> And there's the final product, right? There's the, uh, the new outfall head wall over here um, to provide all the range. And as you can see right now, the structure is significantly higher than the current grade. And this is where the elevation of where the new Lazarus Park is going to come to eventually. So we still have a long ways to come up to. Uh, an example of some of the utility undergrounding, I just wanted to point out that this is a good slide to, to keep in mind as uh, we invite the Ricky up to talk here later on about what impacts to occur um, this coming construction season. You guys are probably familiar with some of the utility undergrounding that occurred on Main Street, Merchants Row, and Kerners uh, uh, Alley. So trenching in the roadway, some of the impacts that you'll have with traffic. And then the final tree removal. So just to recap the project accomplishments. The micro tunneling and the drainage is installed. It's ready to be hooked up for the main project. It is not in service right now, so if any of you have observed that drainage doesn't appear to be any different than it was previously after we spent all this time and money to improve drainage, it's because we haven't, they haven't put it up yet. Uh, the new outfall has been constructed, the access road has been constructed, all the utilities have been undergrounded, um, the clearing has been complete, and uh, the design, including the landscape, what the final product is going to look like with all, all taking into account this last season, the 
last year. So we set the stage for what's to come, which I know is the big, the big question. So with that, I'd like to, to invite up uh, Nathan Spienberg from Ricky. He's going to walk you guys through what 2019 is going to look like. Good evening. Nathan Spienberg from Ricky. I'm the project manager for the next two, two and a half years um, for the plant construction. In 2019, it's really just picking up from where we left off. We started with the, the low point of the drainage. We're going to continue that drainage up to the connect, final connections of the tunnel in 2020. Um, so that meeting was once we uh, arrived back on site here in mid July, we're going to immediately start with our stormwater, our water, and our sanitary connections that will go in parallel to the new railroad track. Um, so anything along those precast structures and anything as we go from low to high will all get connected in this fall so that when the tunnel gets put in place in 2020, we can connect into those mechanisms and then you'll actually start to see water come out the outfall over at the, the falls. Um, so I don't know what we're going to do is um, because we're lowering the railroad about 15 to 20 feet, we need to put in supportive excavation to facilitate that and to actually install the tunnel. So what you'll see is the drill rigs out again, putting in the, the circular piles um, where they drive them in the ground so that we can go ahead and dig in 2020 and put the precast in. And then finally, there are some areas of rock that you all have seen and are quite aware of. We have some areas that we're gonna try to blast this fall so that we don't lose any schedule next summer when the precast needs to be installed. Um, we'll drill, we'll blast it, and then we'll be ready to dig out next summer. Um, some examples here, um, as you can see, I have blue for water, green for sewage or sanitary line, and then your stormwater line is your bright orange that we've highlighted on the drawing. Um, all of this work is in the Triangle Park area, and the reason we chose this particular drawing um, to show everybody tonight is that here. You can see those crossings across either Main Street, Merchants Row, or down Turner's Alley. And those are probably the biggest impacts you'll see from the utility work this season. Um, and it's very similar to the 2018 work. In 2018, you saw us shut the road down for three to five days. We cut the pavement out, we dug down, we put the utilities in, we filled it back up, and we return traffic to normal. As minimal and as quick as possible um, to minimize the impact. You'll see that we're going to do the same thing this year to get those utilities in and out of the way so that we can return traffic and get people back to their normal schedules. Um, as for the support of excavation, as I discussed, the limit of our support of excavation, we'll just say from Cross Street Bridge down to the old railroad depot for you know in terms of quick identification, but you can see these yellow lines. That's where our drill rigs will move back and forth to put piles either sitting on the railroad track or just adjacent to the railroad track. The drill rigs will not be on any of your traffic roadways. Um, and then where they're anywhere near the Battelle block, they'll actually um, use the temp access road that we put in last year so that people can still get to their, their designated parking spots for the tents of that area. This is what we would go off of for our drawing. Those circled black dots are the uh, casings that we have to put in for the SLE. And this rectangle here just represents a piece of steel that we put at the top of the casings before we start digging next season. These are just some details. You can see the timbers we use. Those that looked at the Triangle Park, you saw the timbers that went down to make the sheer face wall to keep the, the bank from sliding in on our workers. Same detail that will go all on the railroad cut to facilitate putting the new tunnel in. And then this is just an overhead view of the, the driven casings that we'll put in. This season we are going to do the, as much excavation in Triangle Park as we can because if we put that in and make this nice wall, we can use this as a staging area for materials and keep it out of your roadways. So you'll see a lot of work this season to bring this down and it should look, I don't know if it'll look as clean and <laughs> fancy as this photo that you can put together, but you'll have a nice, we'll have a nice landing here to put our drill rigs. Instead of having to walk the drill rigs back up into the fence line by Triangle Park or into the roads, we can keep them down by the railroad tracks for the majority of the work. Here's a quick overview of the schedule. Um, I'm going to call your attention to the, the red boxes here. I talked about uh, blasting of rock. Uh, with negotiations with Vermont Rail, we determined that the best time to do that are four-day railroad closures over a weekend. 24-7 um, to minimize the Monday through Friday impacts of the community. And we'll basically start on Friday morning, the trains will stop, 
We'll remove all the material, we'll blast the rock, we'll fill it back up with material, put the railroad back, and come Monday morning, the train will go back to operating, and we'll stay out of any um, <coughs> traffic areas when we do this. We'll stay right down the railroad cut. So those red blocks are basically a weekend per month, September, October, November, December, that we would do that work to minimize day after day during your work schedule um, impacts. And then everything else that we're doing this season will be primarily Monday through Saturday, 10-hour um, days to 14-hour days um, with the normal work of drilling and or um, placing any of our utilities. Now to go back to what the impacts would look like, we have a picture here of what we did at Merchants Row, um, Printers Alley and Main Street this past season. Um, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see concrete trucks and or pipe crews with a trench. They're going to put the utilities in. They're going to backfill appropriately, put the pavement back, and open the road back up. So what, the way we've broken it down is somewhere late summer, we'll call it August, end of August, we'll do sewer and water line crossings um, for a five-day closure. Um, and then in the mid-fall, we'll do a, another week-long closure on Merchants Road to do our stone water um, and some additional manholes and catch basins. So we're going to try to limit the impacts to one five-day closure at a time, not two, three weeks at a time, so that we can, we can shut it down once, do as much of the utilities and as many utilities that are co-located um, together, and then open it back up for a few weeks, and then do another closure um, to minimize that long duration of lack of traffic. We'll do the same thing for Main Street. Main Street, you can be any more critical to traffic in uh, Middlebury. The idea of what we're going to do is we're going to do the, the major new manhole that needs to go into this. We'll do that at night um, so that we're not right in the middle of the road during the daytime. And then we will have some uh, one or three to five day lane closure. Um, so instead of taking the whole road, we'll spend three to five days where we hop back and forth between the two lanes so we can still maintain traffic and do a part of the uh, utilities at a time. Again, this will look exactly like Printer's Alley and Merchants Road did this season. Um, those of you that saw it, um, where we temporarily closed the road down to, to do the electrical duct bank for Green Mountain Power, it would be the same thing, same duration, same impact. And then Printer's Alley, it will be a full week, and there's a new um, sanitary line that comes from the pump station down the Telgloff that comes all the way up the hill through Triangle Park, and it runs right down Printer's Alley to the final connection point. Unfortunately, that one we will have to shut Kerns Alley down for the entire time. There won't be any traffic just because it's a downhill slope and we need to put that, we need to get that into that final connection or utilize that new force main line. And then, as I already mentioned, for Battelle Block, um, we've already talked to the property owner and the property manager. Um, they understand um, they want it to be kept abreast of our weekly progress meetings so that they can work the parking with their tenants. At times, we're going to have to move people's parking stalls around um, so we can work in one area of the parking lot while they're occupying another. And then at times, all the traffic will go on the temp access road um, when we have occupied that alleyway across the back side of the hill um, right adjacent to railroad tracks. So as you can see here, there's quite a few different closures that we've worked out with the property owner um, to minimize long duration impacts. We'll, we'll shut one portion down for a week. We'll wait a couple of weeks. We'll shut the upper portion down for a week. Wait a couple weeks, and then we'll uh, have another closure for your um, that same sanitary line that goes up and around the tell block in the Triangle Park. Other than that, the impacts that you probably most be aware of for those of you that aren't li literally right in the center of Millbury, um, there will be the added noise um, from the vibrations of the drill rig. Um, for those of you that were here for the last two construction seasons, you should be completely aware. Of know what that noise is. Um, there will be some increased construction projects because we haven't worked for the last couple months. Um, again, we'll have deliveries of pipe and materials. A lot of those deliveries will be to Exchange Street, where we have a lane on yard, to the temporary access road, near the Cross Street Bridge, where we'll put our utility pipes, and then also at the Middlebury Stump Dump, where we can store materials as well. So for those of you who live near those areas, you'll be used to the traffic and have seen our trucks and the deliveries. Um, we're going to try to keep any deliveries or large material deliveries away from Triangle Park, limited to the drill, the drill equipment, where the, the pipes that they put in the ground will have right next to the rigs. And then finally, um, downtown impacts. Literally, those street crossings that I discussed will be the only downtown impacts planned for this season. 
and then John. So we've worked with your uh, community liaison to just try and protect uh, as many of your events as possible for this construction season. So these are 2019 downtown community events, which are in the contract with Kabriki, where Kabriki is not allowed to do construction activities for these dates. So these dates there will be no construction such that these activities can be unencumbered by the project. Um, obviously there will still be construction equipment and such around similarly as there have been in the past two construction seasons, but um, there won't be any noise or additional impacts from construction because they will be shut down. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to let you guys know that we have been working with, with your community liaison who's been uh, actively advocating for the community to try and do as much as we can to limit and mitigate the impacts that we possibly can. So with that, uh, we've got an opportunity for any questions on 2019. We have, uh, so Nick has got, uh, Nick and Laura both have uh, mics, if you could, when you ask your question, just identify who you are so that uh, the viewers and when we do the notes, they can be accurately transcribed and then go ahead. Uh, Fred Kennedy uh, had several week closings there for 2019. Are those weekdays only or do they include weekends? Are they five day closures or seven day closures? So for the 20, 2019 closures yeah. on uh, the merchant's road, those five day closures, anything that you want to? So the the closures that we specified are an actual five day closures. I think Printer's Alley, you said one week, and we were anticipating Printer's Alley being the set, a full seven days. But for the, um, but for all the merchants row, we're anticipating just like 2018, unless there was a weather event, we should be able to start on Monday, finish on Friday, and be done with that. Was everybody able to hear that, or should I repeat any of that? I you. Thanks. So to repeat what I said, to repeat what I said, um, no, I can talk really loud too. Uh, to repeat, to repeat what I said, for Merchants Row, we specified five-day closures, um, meaning a five-day iteration or one grouping of five days. Primarily, like in 2018, we were able to start on Monday and finish by Friday, if not quicker than that. The idea was is that if we had a weather event, it could push it into Saturday, but we're trying to stick to five days so that it doesn't go into a second work week. Hi, my name is Margaret Cloak Middlebury. Uh, I have some questions about uh, the um, explosions and where just just where are they located? Are they right downtown? Where can you give us an idea of the location of them? And the main reason I, I'm asking is I think of uh, businesses and the Episcopal Church is just sitting right on the edge of the street across there. And uh, that's a very old and fragile building. And, uh, I want to know if they're going to uh, do their explosions down there. So, so basically the, the blasting, we call it, is really limited from, you know, right here basically for a point of reference where the hole was, the giant mod shaft was, to about um, directly underneath Merchant's Road Bridge. So it, pretty, it, kind of, it goes underneath both bridges and it, it goes in sense about where that launch shaft was. It's about 300, 350 feet of the, the new track corridor, uh, depending on how deep the rock, or you know, because the rock doesn't, it's not a straight line of rock, it, it goes up and down. But we're anticipating about 300 feet of rock that needs to be blasted so we can dig out 20 feet of thickness of rubble rock to get to where the precast sits in the final condition. And we have to follow the same protocol we did last time. We have to have a monitoring agency come in, set up seismographs, settlement monitoring, and um, sur uh, survey markers so that we can monitor any potential risk to buildings. We have to pre-survey all the buildings and post-survey all the buildings and monitor the buildings throughout all the blasting, as well as dampen the blast by putting blast mats and safety precautions blast limits, etc., um, around the area so that there isn't any risk to the population or the buildings. There's also, there's also been some separate limits that were set up just in respect of that, of that building that are, that are lower than would be normally expected from this 
looking at the construction just because of how sensitive that will be. Okay. Um, just a little addition to that question. Uh, are you going to are you going to be, you said you were going to be doing this on weekends. Uh, how about Sunday morning church at the Episcopal Church? <laughs> if typically Mass is anywhere from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., I think our blast window on Sunday morning is 6 a.m. So it would be prior to the actual Masses. <laughs> one quick one, would you uh, like to just briefly mention, because the, the blasting has been a concern right along, and and the results we saw from last year seemed there was no impact in the downtown. Uh, it went as expected. Well, it was over near the National Bank, so. We, we just finished the post survey on all the buildings um, from last year's blasting, and there weren't any notable changes to any of the structures or buildings um, due to last year's project. Gene Sealer, Merchant uh, Battelle Park resident. Uh, are we going to continue? Will we have 24/7 access to our parking lot? Because you're going to be building uh, the, the sewer is going to be where the temporary road is on the on, on the high side. So the the sewer will be coming down your current driveway. Um, so when they're installing the sewer on your driveway, the driveway will be closed and will be putting residents onto the temporary access road. So you'd be entering from Water Street down the temporary access road into the. the okay, but we will always. You won't be. Where is the sewer line going in in relationship to the temporary access road? Adjacent to it, but on the uh, opposite side of the existing railroad right against the embankment where the tree clearing is happening. Does it go all? I I was under the impression it was it was going from mining area to to cross street. It's before you cut down all those trees on south uh, on the back side of South Pleasant Street. Yes. Yeah, so there's a uh, there's utility work for the entire length of the project. And we're going to sequence our construction work so that when we're doing utility work along the temp access road, you won't be driving on it. You'll be using the existing Battelle block driveway. And when I have to use the Battelle block driveway to put utilities in, I won't have any work remaining in the access road so that it's only, we'll call it non-construction related traffic on that road. Well, that's going to put an awful lot of heavy equipment on that temporary access road. And is that going to stand up with, with that kind of activity? I, I watched it go in, and it, it compacted dirt. And then you put down, uh, then you put down gravel, and that's it. And how long is that going to stand underneath construction tracks? So the temporary access road in 2019 is going to be primarily what you see now until we'll call it mid-November, and then prior to the 2020 season, it will be fully paved with Jersey barriers, and it will be for. Um, okay. all the vehicles. But this season, since we have to dig it up multiple times and, 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 and switch traffic over between the Patel Block driveway and the Temp Access Road, we'll maintain gravel um, and we'll maintain and grade as necessary to keep it from being a pothole mess, which I think you might be worried about by your... Um, however, it will get paved at the end of this season so that we don't have that come spring next year. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Baker, uh, owner of 42 Main Street, and I was told by Vermont Gas that we could not get gas in that block from the bank uh, down to where Danforth Peters is until you finished there and uh, I was told that by Dale Valley and I wonder if you know when you will be finished and when they might get in to install those gas lines. I think it's on. So we actually had a coordination meeting with Vermont Gas. Um, we're trying to get them in there uh, this construction season if possible because we don't want them to come in after we're done and tear up our final product. So we haven't fully executed the logistics of when they're going to go in in addition to Ricky doing their utility work, but our plan is to try and uh, sequence it so it's concurrent with any of their utility crossings to further limit traffic. Um, so they just sent us actually a draft plan of where they'd like to be with their gas line and we have to make sure that it fits through all of the other utilities that we're relocating and that there's no conflict. So we are trying to get it in there before we're done um, and not wait till after. But it should be for the 2019 heating season, right? I don't know the answer to that. It should be installed hopefully in this 2019, but I don't know when they would be able to make it live or um, energize it or hook it up to, to uh, you know, potential customers. Thank you. Dave hey, Devine, the tow uh, your uh, answer to Gene talked about the driveway as being an area where 
you were going to excavate. And that's the only access for the residents to get down to the parking lot. So where do the residents walk to get to their car? Um, so the kind of graph for you. Yeah, I know. Go back to that. See the bottom one. Yeah, so per the design documents, um, the stamp and seal documents that were issued part of our contract, we have to maintain a five foot walkway all around from that access point and from the emergency staircase all the way around so you can still have access to your cars. So we're not gonna have mounds of dirt piled up along where you're used to walking every morning. There is a, we have to have a protected access five feet off the face of the building. Good. My second question, because we are in the tell block, is the, uh, you said there may be 12 hour days, if not longer? We have windows that were allowed up to 14 hour days starting in August. And during that there will be construction work, beep, 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 banging, uh, drilling, what kind of sound remediation will there be for people trying to live in those places? So the, the drill rigs themselves, the, the drill rigs themselves are going to be similar in volume to what they were last year. You know, there's a, actually in, in reality the total number of piles that are on the, the length of the corridor or the work rate adjacent to the Battelle block is, is really fairly limited. So that, we won't be there for an extended period of time. Um, as far as the backup alarms go, for, for a lot of our equipment, we can put the quiet alarms in, which are, instead of the sharp beep that you hear, it's more of a, it's still, you know, you can hear it, it's audible because it's for the safety and protection of the workers, but it's more, uh, muffled as opposed to the, the, the sharp uh, sound that you hear. So a lot of, you know, most of the equipment will have that that uh, quieter, they call it a quiet back of alarm system. Um, you know, other than that, the, uh, the the idea of the 14 hour windows is that we're kind of, we're not making noise, you know, come seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, you know, we're, we're wrapping up and we're shutting down for the, for the nighttime hours, so we're sort of limiting that impact on, on the residents there. Starting at six. Starting, We're starting at seven and yeah we start at seven. The work windows are seven to nine, which I think matched the tower rooms I believe for construction notes. Victoria Nguyen Millbury. Um the picture you had of the one week closure of Pinter's Alley made me wonder about pedestrian access from say the bank to the post office. Mm -hmm. I mean that sidewalk disappears. So um, I'm just wondering what the pedestrian access would be. So that pedestrian access would be accommodated, accommodated similarly to how it was uh, when the temporary bridges were installed. Um, I believe we have we have a plan to put in additional infrastructure like a, a shuttle for the 2020 closure, and I don't know if we have any accommodations in there for the 2019. But uh, that's something that we can we can take a, a look into. And the way we would handle that in the construction and things is that we would we would immediately get through that sidewalk and backfill and the fir, you know the first of that week closure so that we can get that back operational as we head down the hill towards the final tie-in location. So it won't be leave a giant gaping hole from the sidewalk all the way down the end of Prairie's Alley for seven days straight. It, it will backfill as we can so that we can get the sidewalk back in running order. Um, so it's not it's not a seven-day closure of that sidewalk. It's a seven-day closure of Main Street. Right. The time is right adjacent to Main Street, and we should be through that sidewalk on the first day. Um, my name is Christine Ford. I'm here for my mother-in-law, who lives on Willard Street. And I know there's a couple of houses that are very close to the right-of-way in that location. And I'm just wondering like, how that's going to be, how the construction impacts are going to impact those properties. Across from the train station? Across from the old train station? The, the northern point, most point of the project. Yeah, the northern most point. So uh, there is support of excavation ends up there. Uh, for 2019, there's one utility crossing in the railroad up in that location. Um, and they, the, uh, you'll see some construction truck traffic during the days. Um, How do they access the rail line? Is the rail line going to be, is there going to be blasting in that location, or the rail line is not going to be lowered there? You have the fortunate lo location of the job where there isn't. Oh, I shouldn't say this out loud because I'd probably curse myself, but there isn't any rock speculated to be in the very north end of the job. Um, 
So you won't have any blasting activities at that part of the project. They will be driving sheet piles, which are large metal sheets rather than circular piles like that's going to be closer to the post office from about where um, the fire department is all the way to the north end of the job. That's where the sheet pile is templated and some utility work. The majority of the impact on the north end of the job is actually off of Seymour and the Marble Works entrance drive um, because we have to put a stormwater line in there to tie into existing stormwater on that end of the, the project. Um, but as for the back of those property areas, um, I think 2020, when the actual large excavation starts, is probably the majority of the impact. This season, it would be, I would think, still pretty minimal for those landowners. <coughs> Thank you. Question over here. I'm Holly Stabler, and I'm from Middlebury. I wonder if you have uh, any contingency plans for. Uh, such happenings as uh, Sandy, or Irene, or a hurricane, and what happens to the access road, and, and, and say if there's flooding of the Otter Creek, uh, have you thought about that? So we don't actually have a contractual contingency plan with Cabricki. However, we would be fortunate enough that they're fully mobilized on site with all of their equipment such that we could respond to that you know, unplanned event as quickly as possible and put the infrastructure back in place. Um, but to answer your question, there, there isn't a contingency plan um, speculative on a, uh, a large catastrophic event. We've had a lot of rain this past year. A absolutely, absolutely. Um, but we'll be prepared to respond to those events on the event that they do occur. Um, it's hard to plan for not only the magnitude of it, but we would, we would do as we always do and, and gear up and then um, execute as quickly as possible to put things back together. So are there any other questions on 2019? I did. Laura? Laura? Oh, certainly. Um, so could you talk about traffic mitigation or navigation when Merchants Row was closed? Now I'm talking about South Pleasant Street and the impact there. Or are you, are you going to address that when we get to 2020? We do have a, a traffic piece for 2020 because that, that closure is more extensive, um, so we can talk about it at that point. Okay, so okay. we'll wait for that. And if, if you don't feel like we adequately addressed it, please re-ask and we'll make sure we dive in deeper. Can I get a mic up front? Frank McBurn, no very. Uh, I know that most of the drainage system is still in place, but I don't know, maybe I'm dim-witted or something, but could you just show the, the, uh, the slide of, the, the, of that system and explain a little bit about how it works, please? Sure. So we'll go back to the, the 2018 recap here. <coughs> Bear with me. Okay, so, so here's the system, the drainage system. So essentially, the tunnel is coming through right where my highlighter is here. And I'll come up the point. It might be a little easier, folks, if I don't get in the way of the projector here. So the rail line's here. This is where the new tunnel's coming in place. The, the tunnel's going to have drainage in the tunnel that drops into a pipe. The pipe is going to go under the railroad tracks and tie into the new uh, manhole which is installed here. So from the launch shaft that we drilled in last year, we, uh, we drove a tunnel through here to this point where there'll be a catch basin. So the water's going to flow under the railroad tracks to a catch basin here, then flow to where the launch shaft is here, which is a catch basin, and then ultimately flow out to the outfall here. Then water from the northern part of the project is going to flow this way to this catch basin and then ultimately out the outfall as well. Thank you. So this year we're basically extending those lines further down that railroad corridor to catch the water on the railroad tracks. Are there? Yes, sir. So we'll we'll continue the runs that run along the tracks all the way out to roughly Cross Street Bridge, and then all the way out to roughly Seymour Street in the north, so that all the drainage along the railroad tracks will catch into sm smaller catch basins. But as the as they get closer to launch, you have to get bigger and bigger and bigger and then out to that outfall. And, and that'll be the same. <laughs> I don't like 
machine that you used last year? These will be regular stormwater pipes with excavators and normal stormwater pipe. We don't need a tunnel anymore. When we say tunnel now, it's the tunnel for the railroad track. Ellen Cronin, um, so if the, if the entire uh, railroad is being dropped 20 feet, how is that going to affect the railroad going over Seymour Street? So it's, it's uh, some of the excavations, it's 20 feet, but the, the new rail line is not going to be that low. Uh, I think it's on average 8 to 10 feet down here at the lowest point. Um, what's that? For the top of the rail. So, but essentially, uh, the project's constrained actually by the the, uh, the truss bridge to the, the south, and then the uh, the is it East Street to the north, uh, Elm Street, Elm Street, sorry, Elm Street to the north. So those two bridges are fixed points within the rail corridor that we had to massively disintegrate. So the project's low point is along Triangle Park, and then it, it basically rises as it goes north and south to match into the existing railroad elevations um, before you get to both. Are there any other questions? Now, 2020 is going to be a little more extensive, so I want to make sure we move ahead to that. All right, so we're going to go on to 2020. I think Nathan, you're probably up again, or Mark. Continue 
and, and remove the Main Street temporary bridge, finish demolition of the existing abutments and, and block walls, and excavate and install the balance of the supportive excavation to make grade for the, for the precast structures. Uh, we'll move right into precast uh, concrete installation. Once, uh, once that's in place, we'll start backfilling, we'll rebuild the roads and, and pave the open merchants and Main Street back up. And uh, we will reinstall the track inside the new structure. <clears throat> kind of gives you an idea of what, what it's going to look like when, uh, when the bridges are removed. The excavation will start in the center, almost the center of Triangle Park is about the low point of the structure. And we'll move in both directions to excavate and install the supportive excavation. Trucks will exit out of either end of the project at this time. This is a schematic of, uh, you know, you can see for those of you that live right downtown or travel down there, this is what the supportive excavation system will look like when it's in place pretty much over the, the length of the, of the corridor. Once uh, excavation is, is, is well along down the tracks, we're going to start setting precast concrete pieces. Um, again, working from the center of, of the Triangle Park area, first heading south, and then coming back and heading north down the corridor, setting the actual precast elements themselves. Uh, during that closure, um, the vast majority of that material will be, you know, will be moving from the Fifield Farm to the site. It's about a mile and a half trip to downtown. There's about 390 pieces of precast to install during that period after the excavation is completed. Uh, we will be, we, we intend to set about one piece per hour per crew. There will be a point in time we have two crews setting precast, but typically you'll see uh, one piece an hour over, the, over that period of time when we're putting the precast in place. This is a schematic out of the contract drawings. It shows the, the actual precast elements. In the tunnel section, which is right where Triangle Park is, extending across Merchants and Merchants Row and Main Street, it's a two-piece clamshell design, so you set a bottom half and a top half. Uh, beyond that, both north and south, they're, they're U-wall sections, so there's a, a bottom U-wall piece, and then in instances there are wall extensions that, that raise up to match into the existing grade adjacent to the road. Pieces are bolted together. These are some of the details for how the individual precast pieces are bolted, so each piece is pulled together and bolted to stay in place. Once, uh, once the tops are in, you can see in this, in this picture here, we're still setting precast to the north, but we're backfilling and reconstructing roadways um, as we go to, to reopen uh, Merchants Row and Main Street. And then once back in place, the, you know, the pavement will be reinstalled. We actually have some milling and paving to do beyond the extent of the actual crossings themselves to transition into the roadway and over the, um, the railroad track will be reinstalled in, a, in, a, in really what is a temporary fashion in panels at this point in time uh, to get the rail the rail back in service uh, and then Main Street and Merchant Road will be open to both vehicle and pedestrian traffic. Then uh, post closure activity uh, we'll come back in, or a rail subcontractor will come back in and install the continuously welded rail from one end of the job to the other. That can be done with little impact to the railroad. Um, they'll do the surface, the railroad surface and final grading. Um, we will set, there's a cast in place wall section that goes on top of the majority of the U wall, which will then accommodate a, a handrail or, and or fence depending on the location. So all that work will happen. The general site fencing installation and final grading and uh, landscaping planning and, and irrigation. So this is kind of the timeline of the hours coming in. Um, the, the red indicates um, the actual outage period. Um, leading into that in April, we'll be working the standard 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday shift while we're moving in and setting up. There will be some, some night work um, over, you know, the, the crane in Triangle Park will have to be assembled at night. It takes a pretty significant piece of space to do that, so we'll be doing some work in the street there. We're putting it together at night. Um, 
but beyond that, um, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, from May 4th to May 22nd, we'll be down working on the rail corridor primarily after the bridge is removed. Um, work hours from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then uh, when we come in for the, for the closure on May 27th, we'll be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week until it's done. So that's, uh, that's going to be the busiest time uh, in Middlebury that summer with, with, that, with that construction. Pre-closure, pre um, you know, we're looking at about three nights to put the cranes together um, in the middle of downtown. Um, there will be some increased truck traffic on Route 30, just with the with the number of precast pieces that are coming in. Once uh, our supplier gets geared up, you're probably looking at 20 loads of precast a day coming into into that staging yard outside of town. Um, you know probably going to start in the February time frame so we have all the precast in, you know within a mile and a half of the job before the closure period starts. During Merchants Row, um, the temporary bridge is going to be removed which is going to you know stop traffic on um, Merchants Row during that period of time. Um, it'll take a, a few days to disassemble the bridge at that time it'll be sitting up in front of the park like in front of where the old diner was um, until we can get it disassembled and, and sent back to V-Trans. Um, after that, we'll be working primarily from the bottom in the rail bed for most of our activity during that period. So you have some reduced parking along Merchants Row and, uh, and then we'll pause from uh, May 23rd to 26th for graduation. Uh, most of that parking will reopen um, and, and we'll come back in for the main closure after Memorial Day weekend. During, during the actual closure, you know, main, obviously Main Street Merchants Row will be closed throughout that 10 week period, um, starting on May 27th. The, the railroad will also be removed and disassembled, so there'll be no rail traffic through town. It'll be on a complete detour for the 10 week period. We have to move about 27,000 yards of soil out of the corridor. That'll put about 20 trucks running around the clock during the excavation, which is about 1,800 truck trips to the, to the stockpile area. Uh, we'll be delivering timber lagging and installing that at the same time. And, and then that will move right into um, aggregate deliveries for the, for the stone bedding for the precast. So the same number of trucks moving in and out of the site during that period. To move the, the precast into the erection areas downtown, you're going you're gonna to see a pretty steady flow of six to seven um, delivery trucks moving the precast from the Fifield Farm to the to the main correction point in Triangle Park, um, over in, in about the center of that 10-week outage period. Um, precast will be delivered to primarily to the to the Triangle Park area, but also through Marble Works and Seymour Street for for various parts of the of the sequence. This kind of a schematic that shows where the trucks will come in through the roundabout back into the crane pad and Triangle Park for, for the majority of the erection. It also shows the route for, for getting through Marble Works to uh, be a, another crawler crane set up uh, really right across from the post office, from, from the post office to the, to the old rail station, working back and forth where the yellow is denoted there. And then we'll also have some deliveries up on Seymour Street. So essentially, um, the roadway reconstruction will happen as soon as the, the boxes are set, the tops are on and backfilled. Um, there'll be some sidewalk reconstruction in front of the, the businesses down there. We'll, we'll stage that so that the businesses are open during the, the construction of the sidewalk. Um, it'll be phased to allow pedestrian traffic in and out. You'll have your installation of the new base course and paving within the project limits, and then, and then a reopening for the, for the two streets on, on or about August 5th. Um, we had committed internally with V-Trans to uh, make every attempt to try to open Merchants Row first because we believe that's probably going to advance faster than the other than the Main Street Bridge. So, if we're in a position to uh, to do that, we're gonna we're gonna make every effort to do so. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron Guyette for the for the MPT and road closures. Aaron Gaillac from VHB. 
I'm just going to quickly go through the, the traffic control side of things. Uh, so, Mark went over the road closures. 2020, uh, Main Street, Merchants Row, uh, both closed off the traffic. Um, it, primarily construction vehicles and also accommodations for deliveries to the downtown businesses. Primary um, detour route is for northbound traffic on Route 30. Uh, come up, go through the roundabout, cross street to Court Street, and then north on, on Route 7. Uh, similar route going south. Because we, as we look at this, there's a few um, intersections that really need, um, there's some evolving thoughts on, on a few of these intersections. Um, the intersection at, at Court Street, Cross Street, is uh, we'll see a significant amount of traffic, a significant amount of trucks turning uh, in directions that they don't turn today. Uh, we'll be making a few slight modifications to stop our locations, uh, the, uh, the pavement markings to, to accommodate those, and then retiming the signal uh, to accommodate that additional traffic as well. The uh, South Pleasant Street intersection, concern there about uh, traffic being able to get to that intersection and then be able to take a left uh, across um, conflicting traffic we are considering making a few changes to that intersection that's still evolving a bit. And then, of course, the roundabout location, as Mark just talked about, a lot of traffic uh, up and down to 30, and then making sure that we're safely separating the construction traffic from the, the regular roadway traffic. Uh, we will have a number of flaggers and uniform traffic officers to be able to help uh, direct those uh, uh, maneuvers. Um, it's probably it's probably important to, to point out as well that we've we put a lot of a lot of effort into the traffic um, traffic control planning here. We met with Kubricki on site multiple times. We've done our modeling. We've got uh, twenty something different scenarios for lane closures and uh, road closures and traffic sign packages. And despite all of the, the planning that we've done that we've done, uh, we realize that. Still a dynamic process, and so even even after construction, we're going to uh, kind of live monitor the, the traffic, um, and we'll be making some tweaks, or we'll have the ability to make some tweaks on the fly, uh, especially at some of these these key intersections. We'll be working with Cooper Heat um, to make modifications as as needed. The pedestrian mobility, um, so blue represents. Uh, open pedestrian areas, and then red, the areas that are across the railroad represent closed areas during that 2020 closure period. Um, there, is, there, there is some accommodations, and, and it's still in the planning stages right now for um, shuttle bus to be able to get folks back and forth either side of the, uh, the railroad corridor, uh, as well as to circulate throughout, throughout downtown. Uh, parking impacts, these, um, the yellow areas shown on, on Main Street and Merchants Row will be impacted during construction and close at one point or another. The, the green areas are really all the other public parking areas that are around, surrounding downtown and that will remain open during construction. And with that, I will turn it back over. talk about um, post-closure impacts. Um, what everybody, hopefully everybody's high-fiving each other and we're, we're congratulating each other when the roads open back up and the, the railroads going back up in operation. But there's still a, a decent amount of work that needs to be continued after everything's open back up again. Um, so being that said, we still have to do the, Aaron's going to talk a little bit later about the landscaping package, but there's still sidewalk um, tree, be prepared to put plantings in and trees in. There's still sidewalks across Triangle Park. There's going to be sidewalks down to the new Lazarus Park. All of that still has to be graded and um, everything put back in order to facilitate that landscaping package. So once the roads open back up in August, we still have August through the rest of the fall of 2020 to continue work to be prepared for you know spring plantings and landscaping in 2021. Um, what impacts you'll see, Triangle Park will still be closed, um, and you'll see why when Aaron goes through the, 
the renderings of the, the landscaping package because there's a, 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 it's going to look very very nice but there's a significant amount of work to get ready for that um, and then we still have the intermittent sidewalk closures and new sidewalks that Mark talked about um, to keep the storefronts open so the idea was instead of to drag out the closures even longer than the, the rail closure and impact traffic and pedestrian traffic we'll do intermittent sidewalk closures through the fall to keep businesses operational and not impact it all at once. Um, Printer's Alley versus Road Main Street will all have work that needs to be completed um, and, and it's going to drag out through the fall just so we can minimize the impact after a 10 week closure. Um, some of the challenges in 2020 um, that this kind of rehashes some of the things we are brought up and I'm sure some of you will have questions on traffic control that uh, Aaron just described, um, the crossing court street intersection, the roundabout especially when we're moving our precast through that roundabout to get into Main Street to unload. And then delivery vehicles, keeping those delivery vehicles to those businesses while we are doing the same offloading of precast. Um, some of the construction constraints that we'll have, there's not a lot of room that we have for storing materials either. Um, it's not a nice giant football field on either side of the railroad tracks that we can put all the material we want. Um, so the same, some of the same griefs that you have when we're seeing delivery trucks in, we have those same issues on the construction side because we can't just flood the, the roadways with delivery trucks. We have to stage them at Fightfield Farm. We have to control the flow and bring them in in a nice, slow, easy manner so that we're not, one, getting a traffic jam created, which would delay our delivery, which would delay our schedule, or also delay you getting to work or to whatever point that you had in the day. Um, as for that, um, we're taking all of our soil materials away from the railroad and away from our excavation to Fightfield Farm or directly off-site to um, dispose of it so that we don't have large piles of dirt in the 2020 season scattered from one end of the rail to the other that would be in the way of cars, create blind spots, etc. It will be immediately put in a truck and brought off-site as we do. Some of the other challenges that we be honest about, unpredictable weather, which I think we talked about during the 2019 discussion, um, we, we do, we can only work so much when it starts to rain. Um, we start to get thunder and severe lightning storms. It, it does shut down our operations. So just to keep everybody abreast, you know, if there is unpredictable weather or really bad thunderstorms, Kabricki has to shut down work as well until it's safe for our workers to work. Um, and then as for working at night, we plan on working 24 seven, like we mentioned. We're gonna work right through the night. We have multiple shifts, so they're not working with the same crews every shift or 24 hours at a time. However, we do have to be cognizant that they're working under limited light considerations. They have to be careful about their noise. And even when they're used to work at nights, they're still not as fast as you would a day crew would be. So those are also the challenges that Caribbean has to work through. So uh, 2020 downtown accessibility. Um, as uh, Aaron pointed out, we are going to implement a shell service for pedestrians because uh, that shuttle service, that connection is going to be severed. Um, phased sidewalk construction so that we maintain access to all of the businesses at all times. Um, we are partnering with uh, the Better Middlebury uh, Partnership, I think that correctly, and uh, Neighbors Together uh, to provide them with a grant to help maintain economic vitality downtown. So um, rather than steal their thunder, if you guys have questions about that and about the, the great work that they're doing, you can contact uh, Karen and Nancy to ask them questions. But uh, we're supporting that effort because we understand that this is a, a hardship and we're, we're uh, cognitive of that and we want to support the great work that they're doing. Um, and some of the things that they are doing have been highlighted here. So once again, 2020 community events. Um, as we all know, this is the, the big closure. So uh, we're going 24 seven with construction during those 10 weeks. Um, but we are protecting the, the bike summit May 8th, which is uh, will occur right after the emergency road bridge has been removed. Um, the, the Middlebury Filmmakers Festival, which is August 27th and 30th, and then uh, we'll be partnering with Neighbors Together for other events around town, so be on the lookout for those. Thank you, and, and uh, before I go into questions, I'm just going to highlight a couple things that the town is going to be doing it uh, concurrent with this project. So you'll see things like, I know there's a lot of discussion uh, that came our way on tree clearing and some private property owners took advantage of the uh, project 
work that was going on to do some additional tree clearing and that's not a part of the project. So um, when he talks about sidewalks, we're actually going to be doing more sidewalk work than was necessary for the project. But well, we have contractors there who specialize in it, who do it. And the town will take that opportunity to refresh our, our cracked sidewalks in the downtown area. So, um, you know, there, there is, uh, will be some additional work that you didn't see here, but that we will plan to do concurrent with this project. And like they're doing, it will be phased so that we try to minimize disruption. So with that, uh, questions? Um, I'd like to ask about the, the Fifield farm as a choice for the staging area. Uh, if I heard you correctly, you're going to be taking the excavated material, the construction rubble, out to put on the farm. And then why would you use the rail yard if the railroad is going to be shut down as a staging area and move the structures along the rail and avoid adversely affecting the farmland and the traffic through that part of the downtown and the college. Is there a way to, to stage it from another area? The, the usable space in the rail yard is limited. Um, the, foot, the sheer footprint of the precast is, um, is going to take around six acres exclusive of the access roads in the crane area there. So it, it was it, part of the part of the decision on the structure side was the just the sheer area that we need. Did you say six acre? Yes. There's a lot more than six acres in the road. Uh, not, not not for usable space with a crane. The, the material has to be laid out in rows so you can load it and unload it. It takes up a, a pretty significant footprint. There's all those siding. There's no rails. So. So the, the railroad is going to be closed to the project area, but the rail yard itself is still going to be open. That's going to be the end of the rail line. So the rail yard itself is going to be busier than it is today with uh, being able to shift and uh, switch trains. It's, it's the end of the line. The railroad still has to be able to serve their customers between Middlebury and Burlington. It's just severed through Middlebury. Yeah, along that line, Fred, uh, we, we looked for all opportunities to uh, bring it closer so there was less truck traffic. And one of the considerations that went into play was where the soil was going to eventually be disposed, disposed in, and um, it would be, if we went to the north side of the project, you still got to then bring it all back through to get it out to where it would be disposed of in New York. And so uh, it, we didn't, we do not have within Vermont the capacity to, to handle with contaminated soils. And so it has to go to a, a, a site that's capable of handling that. And uh, this reduces overall the amount of truck traffic that goes through the river. There's a lot of thought put into that, actually. A practical question. How does the level of the railroad compared to the level of the river. You're talking about dropping it eight feet. Um, what's the what's 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 the level of the railroad track compared to the level of the uh, of Otter Creek? Aaron, can you answer that? So, so the the railroad itself is only going to be dropped um, it's probably in the three to four foot range. Uh, excavation is going to be in the 12 to 13 foot range. Um, there's a lot more excavation that takes place to build the materials in, the thickness of the box, the ballast, and go up to the tracks. Um, it's going to be above the level of your, your uh, water creek. normal water level of Water Creek. Uh, how do you coordinate with the post office? Because they have you know, they make deliveries every day to the Telblock and all those buildings, and they're, they're in the, the new drive zone. I think, uh, Jim, Nick, okay. the question is, uh, what, about, what about getting our mail delivery to people in um, the residents and, and businesses in the tell block and the, res the residents and businesses along the closed portion of Main Street because we're cut off the post office, so we have sad tracks at this point. Right, right. <clears throat> so the post office will be working with their carriers to position themselves on the other side of town. I talked with the postmaster about that. He's not concerned about the ability of his carriers to continue to deliver the mail downtown, even with the 
uh, with the open cut of, uh, between Main Street and Main Street. And FedEx and UPS? FedEx and UPS will come in from down, they, they will have access straight down Main Street. Uh, you know, the guys at Puka Bricky talked about uh, delivery that would include FedEx and UPS from both sides. Thank you. Uh, I have, uh, my name is Steve Meyer, and I have some questions about uh, traffic, truck traffic, and at least starting off with the precasts. Are they going to be both, I guess, the deliveries to the Fineville Farm, which you said would start in February, and then the deliveries back into town? Are these oversized loads? Uh, one of you talked about flaggers, and, and so I'm just curious to understand exactly what's going to, what's going on when these trucks come through town. Is the entire road going to be closed for the entire stretch from from the golf course down through Main Street, so that no other traffic can be going on when the truck comes in, or are these more normal sized vehicles? The majority of the precast are oversized loads. Um, they'll be escorted in and out of town. There are a couple areas along in front of the college where it's pretty congested right there. So there'll probably be some intermittent, just hold up traffic very briefly while the piece moves through, but no, no real long-term type of disruption as the pieces go through. Um, we're gonna also um, look to flip some of the pieces upright in the yard and ship them in that way as best we can when we can clear the overhead restrictions and that will eliminate the over width concern when we're moving into town um, so together you know with the escorts and we also have some uniform traffic officers and flagging vehicles um, you know we feel we'll be able to move it in a town with you know minimal disruption in terms of having you know you're not looking at having to close the entire road from you know from the uh, from the traffic circle back past the college to move the precast in and out we have enough so, for there to do that. I live on South Street, and I can tell you, as I'm sure many other people in town can tell you, that. So, my, the question is I'll give you a fill in the context, but the question is are you going to schedule those in such a way as to avoid the, the already congested times along that roadway? So, at between 7.45 and 8.15 in the morning, it can be almost impossible to get out from South Street onto um, South Main Street and into town. Similarly, at either three in the afternoon or five in the afternoon, you can sit there for quite a little while trying to get out into the road. And if we're adding this to it, I'm wondering whether you're either scheduling outside of those known time frames or whether you have traffic control folks that will actually assist the, the traffic flow uh, if it does get backed up in those areas. So, so right now we don't have, we're, we're not scheduling out, you know, trying to avoid those time frames just due to the overall uh, schedule for the job. We can't, we need to keep setting it during that period. So we have a pretty significant effort going on with escorting and flagging and traffic control, adjusting timing of light. So to try to minimize that, that traffic as best we can. Uh, as you say, it's already gridlock, you know, right now during certain times and, and certainly the uh, the trucks that are moving in and out are gonna sit in that same traffic during periods of time um, moving in and out of town. I thought you said you were closing off so the trucks trucks could get through. So they're gonna be in traffic or you're gonna be well, it's still in this traffic. Yeah, we're, it's still gonna, it is going to impact the flow of the precast in through town. I can't stop traffic indefinitely while I move, you know, the, the precast pieces in. But, you know, we'll have to do the best we can to work through those congested period of time, you know, and during rush hour, both morning and, and afternoon. I guess I would just, I'll, I'll hand it over here in a second. I would suggest that those times don't, they don't actually last terribly long. They last about a half an hour at a time. So it might be one of those tweaks that Eric, I think is his name, was talking about that you might want to consider now would be to avoid those times, both for your own purpose and for the folks in town. Yes, Eric Davis, uh, my question is also about traffic concerns on Route 30, uh, particularly to the, to the representative from, from B-Trains. Have you thought at all because of the extensive truck traffic that will be moving in and out 
notify fields of relocating the start of the 50 mile an hour zone from the top of the hill to a point perhaps near the Cornwall Middlebury town line. So traffic would be going s slower past the five field farm area. At this time, we have not looked at changing the posted speed limit in that vicinity at all. Uh, and we are going to be working with our uh, our TISMO section to evaluate overall regional construction impacts uh, relative to traffic and those are the types of questions that they help us uh, analyze to see if there's a benefit. So that's a, a good point and we'll take that note back to those folks. Jeff, I think that's a good idea. We hope somebody's got that in notes. Aaron does, right Aaron? Uh, hi everybody, it's Mark. Um, I had a few questions about the Cross Street and Court Street intersection which is very near where I live. Um, <clears throat> it, I, I've been living in Middlebury for close to a year now and I'm uh, <laughs> navigating mostly by foot. And that intersection today is already extremely unsafe by foot. Um, I've been very, very nearly hit um, three times. And I'm, I'm like gigantic and very noticeable and I wear reflectors at night and I wave and, smile at everyone when I'm crossing the street, especially, you know, in the age of distracted driving. And still, I, there have been so many close calls that it makes me really, really nervous to see a map where only the pedestrian mitigation is happening downtown and not anywhere. There's no way to get to those areas um, that, that are really, really safe, especially if you live on the other side of uh, Cross Street or Court Street. So I wonder, you know, when you're talking about signalization and, um, and, and changing lane markings and things, have, are, has it only been motor vehicle traffic that's been taken into consideration uh, at, those, at that particular intersection, but perhaps elsewhere along, along the, the traffic route? Uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is actually the case, that we've only looked at the signal timings due to the increased traffic through those intersections, and I don't think we. Sorry, you mean motor vehicle traffic? Correct. Okay. Increased motor vehicle traffic at those intersections, and not increased pedestrian traffic at this point. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's going to be the same for for people that are driving cars. So right now, the, the way it stands as we as we are having this conversation, yes. But uh, I think that's a good point that we can take a look at and see if there are improvements that we can make. You know, either site improvements, um, signal improvements. Uh, you know any of those enhancements that might make it safer. So thank you for the input. It's, it's something that we can definitely take back, Aaron, to your accommodations. Cool, thanks. A question about the, uh, we have a post office, which is going to be isolated from us in the hotel block in most of town uh, at the uh, south side. So is there any thought about putting a temporary post office to sell postage and Drop yeah. We haven't given any consideration to the post office logistics. Um, I'm not sure if the post office has or not. Um, Jim, do you have any information there? That, that is a question that's been discussed with Joe Laramie, again, the postmaster. Is there, a, is there an opportunity to uh, have commercial services out in the Exchange Street facility, which is where they do their mail sorting? So that, that, that is a possibility, but it hasn't been uh, flushed out yet with uh, the postmaster. Um, so, um, so we're still looking at ways to make sure that folks can get into the post office, get their post office boxes, take care of business at the post office. There will be 11 parking spaces uh, open on Main Street right in front of the post office, and there will be flaggers um, at Seymour Street, the intersection of Seymour Street and Main Street that will be making sure that people can get in safely uh, in their vehicles or walking into the post office from that area. I have another question. And, and a shuttle stop, too. Uh, another question was about the Ashlar. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it. Ashlar blocks, they're the Ashlar. large stone blocks in the rough order. There is a uh, insurance company that I, as I go down to get my car along the Patel block that has its foundation built on that Ascalar uh, foundation. Uh, the plans are on you know, helping them build the uh, retaining wall before you take it out. The, the Boron building, the Boron Insurance Company? Uh, the the uh, Ascalar is right along the... Uh, opposite the Patel block? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so that's uh, part of the, the Rumblestone wall, the Ascalar block wall actually starts underneath the 
bridge. Oh. Um, but there is work occurring in that location. Um, and we're, we're taking necessary precautionary measures to make sure that that building stays um, and that people will stay safe during the time of this project. So that has been, there's been a lot of thought and a lot of consideration relative to that, that particular location in this project. Okay, thank you. Hey, Brian? This is a quick question. Um, you were talking about the inspections before and after of the buildings for the, for the blasting. Are there also plans for inspections before, during, and after of the Battelle Bridge with the, the weight of these loads that are going across that, that old bridge? I honestly I don't think that we have that bridge in the, uh, the APE right now, but that's. But the, uh, as far as uh, any overload vehicles that go over any bridges, um, all, all bridges are evaluated by um, an engineering team within the agency of transportation for any overload vehicle statewide. So that's why truckers have to get permits for overweight, over height structures to make sure that they can go underneath uh, vertical clearances, width clearances, and that they don't exceed the actual capacity of the bridge. So we actually do an engineering analysis on every bridge and every load um, for that purpose to make sure we don't overstress them or damage them. So um, it, it wasn't considered as a pre and post evaluation, but we, we do look at the loads that are going over to make sure that they don't exceed its capacity. If I could just remind people uh, to, to identify yourself before you ask a question, um, we may want to get back to your supplemental question later. Uh, there's been some things that came up here that are good ideas and, and things that we want to look at. So. Uh, it would be helpful for all of us. My question doesn't have to do with the tail block, but it does with the gentleman from the back row of South Street. South Street is the access to our hospital. We're going to have ambulances and not having a flagger at the junction of uh, what we call Main Street and, and South Street can be really detrimental to somebody's health if they can't get. It's going to be bad enough for ambulances to try to get there. Ambulances come here from the surrounding area, not just the Middlebury Township. That's a really serious concern. You really need to have flaggers at that point. That's not an option. So we've been working with emergency services to, uh, to make sure that we have plans in place for those services throughout the duration of construction. Um, so that way we can facilitate you know, um, emergency responses, you know, police, fire, um, ambulatory responses. So uh, that's safety is something we take very, very um, seriously. And, we're working with those entities to make sure that we can accommodate them however we need to to make sure that they have mobility through through the town. Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Lucci from the Addison County Regional Planning Commission. Um, we are one of the sponsors of the Bike Ped Summit, the statewide Bike Ped Summit that's going to be held at the Town Hall Theater on May 8th, just after the closure. VTrans is the other one. Um, we want all of you to be able to move around downtown and use pedestrian walkways and uh, and the actor shuttle and bicycles as, as basically ways of getting around town while this um, shutdown is happening and I hope as part of the mitigation plan we'll be able to talk about some of those solutions as well. Well I think we have a meeting to discuss some of these mobility issues don't we on coming up in the next uh, few weeks haven't we? Hopefully, yes. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, Nancy Dunn, I own a business on Main Street. And Merchants Row, and um, I think everyone here that owns a business is, has been filled with fear and loathing about next May. Um, and my main concern is about signage coming into town from all the different areas. Uh, I feel like if, if there isn't some real creative signage uh, that covers where to go, where to park, when they see the big detour sign, most people would just turn around and go away. And um, in a very seasonal town, this is happening just at the height of our season. So we are all losing big, big money. Uh, and so however, I feel like if there's a flagger, that person's going to need to be handing out maps and have a whole lot more information than, you know, drive this way, drive that way. Those people are going to be key to the success of tourists finding where to go, where to park. You know, they come in from 125 and they want to go to June Road and the Marble Works. I mean, who's going to tell them how to do that? That is clearly some good ideas. The neighbors together is working on some of that and maybe uh, having some handout maps that can go to the flaggers and whatnot. Probably a great idea. Frank? No, no, no. Hi, my name is Kathleen Nelson. 
And I'm concerned about the possible probable destruction to all the roads with all these extra heavy trucks and extra traffic on roads that weren't really meant to have that much traffic. Is there a plan for that in the future? So uh, after the project, there's actually another retrans project coming through, um, which is going to be doing the Class 1 Town Highway paving project. So we'll be taking care of all the Class 1 Town Highways in town with a subsequent project after this. Um, so those roadways will be repaired um, and, and be a, a brand new final product after after this project is complete. <laughs> Nick up front here. Hi, I'm Valerie Smith Hastings, and I own the Zeno House at 31 Court Street. When we were talking about the Court Street and Cross Street intersection, Aaron and I are not strangers on this matter. Uh, when the Cross Street Bridge went in, we had a lot of interesting conversations about how to make my business accessible. So, a question that has been put forth already about how to keep that intersection able to flow with traffic that wants to go in and out of those businesses. I just want to make sure it's on the record early that we would love some extra consideration for the lights or where traffic stops um, and how people can get in and out of that intersection. And I just want to make sure that we've, we've given a great deal of thought to that intersection. It's a very challenging intersection. Um, it's already problematic in its current state without all this traffic. So we, we know it, it's not gonna it's not gonna flow better than it does now. It will be worse. And we're gonna be monitoring it and trying to make it as not bad as possible, if that makes sense. Um, and we have provisions to work with uh, Kabricki and try and monitor it and uh, retime it as needed to to try and make it be as optimal as it possibly can be under these circumstances. Good to know. Go front here. Hi, my name is Megan Brigley, and I am a Water Street resident. I, I hate to beat a dead horse here, but to underscore Mark's comment about the Cross and Court Street intersection, as the pedestrian signals are currently timed, um, there is a white flashing crossing sign that is timed currently with a turning arrow, and so that is remarkably unsafe, and I just hope that we can really look through the pedestrian timing. Um, and I would pose a model that um, some other cities have seen it in Portland, Oregon, you live in Connecticut where the pedestrian crossing is simultaneous and so they actually encourage people to go walk and so all car traffic stops at that time and I think that could be really appropriate given the proximity to Mary Johnson Preschool, to the um, elementary school, to our high school and um, additionally the timing concerns around South Street. Um, I was wondering if you could share, uh, I'm sorry I didn't know. Uh, I was just going to make sure I clarified it on. So you're suggesting a, uh, basically a, a pedestrian phase only for all crossings. <coughs> right. so, okay, I want to make sure so that we can note it down correctly. Um, and I was wondering if you could clarify the route for truck traffic. Um, that 1,800 truck trips to the stockpile area really caught my ear. And I, would, uh, I think that, uh, I feel like there was an assumption that the trip route would be from the Fifield Farm to the downtown area, but I'm assuming that there would also be traffic through the temporary access road from the southern exit. And um, if you could describe the thought process behind some of the truck, heavy truck traffic on some of those um, intersections that are just angled peculiarly that the school buses already have trouble with. So that's, for example, turning from, um, um, let's see, I guess it would be west on Cross Street from Water Street. Um, and I will turn this over to Mark, but first before I do, uh, since they're working concurrently north and south, you know, truck traffic will be looping around through the detour route, and truck traffic will be coming through the, the bottom of the railroad cut out of the temporary access road and onto uh, the water chute. But I think Nathan and Mark can elaborate a little more. Uh, do you want the clicker to on the map? Uh, but yes, we're going to be, there will be truck traffic on, on those routes as well. Um, and I think I want to reiterate that it's, it's 1,800 truck trips total, I think it comes up to uh, five to six trips per hour, approximately. Um, thereabouts, give or take, um, which could be, what, a dozen total trucks in service, thereabouts, um, at any given time. So, um, it, it is a lot, but it's also 24-7, so it's continuous. Um, it's not all that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, that's the, oh, you 
you went by it right there. Uh, that's the truck. Well, that's just showing the tag. That's the So you have about a third of the material that's going to come out through the, I guess that, that is the temporary access show right there, and back out. Um, we're going to try to stage it so that there is some material that comes back and gets reused on site. That material we're going to try to go to the stone dump us or not, going all the way out of town and all the way back through town, okay? But you have about a, th about a third of the material comes out here. The rest of it is going to come out the other end. Um, either up through here and out, or we're still exploring the idea of if we're able to get out at the at the rail depot here and, and then and then out to, to Fight Fields Farm that way. Um, you got about two thirds of the material that's gonna come out either that, you know, through that north end and around in that in that fashion. Um, does that kind of answer your question on where the trucks are going? Okay. If I could just add one additional point, the, the timing in those windows mentioned from our South Street neighbors around school, pick up and drop off times, those are really busy traffic times and already um, drivers take really risky, make really risky moves. I wonder if you've done observation of that area, um, the intersection of South Pleasant Street, Water Street, the Kinney's parking lot, and the Court Street traffic during um, that window between 745 and 15 in the morning. The, the construction is not going to be during the school season. No. But the part of it. It's starting in May. There will be a couple of weeks. In May 27th is when it will start. So there will be a period of overlap during school. Um, but yes, when we do the analysis on these intersections, um, we're taking into account what we call the peak volumes. So those, those, those times where we've got that generate those peak volumes in the intersections. So yes, we have we have considered them. Um, there, there's not a lot that can be done. They're already at capacity or near capacity. Um, so we're we've done we're evaluating everything we believe we can do, and we're going to monitor to see how it how it actually performs, and then uh, modify the approach if it's not performing how it's intended. I'm Peg Martin, and you asked the question that I was going to ask about uh, the condition of the road coming into town. And as I've been sitting here thinking about it, the word that was used was it would be evaluated. And I'm not very happy with that word because when I look at what happens with highway funds, which are never enough, and the period of time during which evaluation takes place. Um, I would at least like to know, and I'm sure the town would like to know, that perhaps we will be a little higher on this very long list when we get to the end of the day. Because if you drive out to the five fields, that is not a road that is prepared to take the kind of trucking that is going to be going over. There's just no question about it. So I, I think we need to do a little more than evaluate. I think there needs to be some real plan in place and perhaps some periodic evaluation rather than just saying, well, we'll get to the end of this. And I'm sure we will. I think it's going to be hard, but I think we will. Um, and then we'll look at it. Uh -uh, that really doesn't do it. So as far as the, I, mean, I want to make sure I understand your concern, um, the roads themselves, there is a plan. We already have a project to, to repair them after. We know they'll be damaged, so the class one town highway project is coming in after this to make repairs to the class one town highways that are damaged. So um, those, there is a commitment, a financial commitment, and a plan and a project in place for that already. And again, that, that is planned to, that'll occur uh, 2021 is when it's supposed to occur. So it'll be the, the, the year following this closure. They, they intentionally pushed that off base so that it would happen after the project it was scheduled to be concurrent with the project. But uh, they pushed that, the state pushed that segment of the highway repaving so that it would be after our project to repair the roads. Good plan. Yes, 
Hi, Joe McVeigh from uh, Middlebury. I just wanted to preface my remarks by uh, thanking Brian and the select board and Jim Gish, our uh, community liaison, as well as the representatives of the group here for coming to share this information with us. I understand there's certainly a lot of issues that we still need to sort out, but frankly, I appreciate the, the transparency and the opportunity to, uh, to, speak, to speak with you. I wonder if the person with the clicker could find the southbound vehicular traffic map. Um, my question is about Court Square. Uh, Court Square currently has a, uh, a counterclockwise um, traffic flow. It appears to me from this diagram that the, the southbound traffic is now going the wrong way around Court Square, past the Middlebury Inn and the uh, community. Uh, Vermont Community Foundation, and uh, given the importance uh, that Nancy pointed out about accurate information for people from out of town, I'm curious to know whether this might have been an oversight of the drafter, or if in fact the traffic flow is going to be reversed to add a new wrinkle uh, to our ordeal. <laughs> so, so we just got fired for that mistake. Uh, that's just a drafting error. So thank you for being so astute as to point it out. We really appreciate that you guys are paying attention and keeping us honest. Yes. Uh, Mike Davis. Um, are, are there liquidated damages on this job? Yes, and they are uh, they're very steep. There's a uh, railroad liquidated damages. Um, so such a time that we do not put this back together in place. Um, the railroad liquidated damages um, will start to occur. So they're, they're extensive. Um, and there's also what we call an incentive and disincentive to uh, incentivize these fine folks to work hard um, to get done even sooner than planned, um, which we hope that they are able to achieve. Have the, disincentive as well. Um, has the precaster been signed up yet? Is he under contract with Kuberki? Yes. And when uh, is, is he doing shop drawings, that, that type of thing? He, he, he'll begin shop drawings here presently. We got our contract today, so we had a letter of intent with him about, I don't know, about a month ago, right, Nate? So, but he, he really, the, today was the day that we can, we got our award letter and we can actually move forward with uh, with engineering and, and material acquisition. So he's, he's so the design, his, how the design is done with the precast? Design is complete with the contract plans that came out, yes. Local local It's not. It's uh, it's coming out of Fort Miller in New York. That's the that was the the most cost effective uh, pre capture for the job. I, uh, I noticed that uh, Merchant's Road apparently is going to reopen for Memorial Day weekend, um, and yet there's not going to be a bridge there. So what does it mean that Merchant's Road is going to be open for those three days? Well, the, right, the, the road will not be open for through traffic, but we will be shut. There will be no construction work happening during that period of time, no impact to the you know, out right out in front of the businesses on either side of the Merchants Row for that for that graduation weekend. Yeah, the parking spots that were taken will be open. Um, minus the, the temporary bridge will be out at that point. Well, but it will not be open to either vehicular or pedestrian traffic. It will not be open to through pedestrian or vehicular traffic. It will be open right up to the to the railroad corridor, so to speak, on either side, but no through traffic. But perhaps for electric lawn jumpers. Uh, uh, and I, I had another uh, question, and that is, uh, during the uh, you know period of chaos in 2020, has there is there a possibility of having a fleet of free bicycles that could be sort of stationed about uh, the town that? Uh, people could use to maneuver around the, uh, the downtown and then get to their destination. That's a really good idea for... Uh... So, uh, sorry. 
Amy Ryan, um, part of the BNP and the Neighbors Together, to answer that question, there's a number of ideas that are floating around that um, part of the grant that's, that will be awarded, uh, we're going to try to utilize those monies for efforts like that, that that people can utilize so that they can use bikes to, I mean, there's like the drop and go or like take a bike, leave a bike, all kinds of ideas, things that we're trying to um, maneuver with. I have a question probably for Aaron. Um, is one of the considerations for, you mentioned the considerations for South Pleasant Street, is one of them just to, uh, to keep or to make South Pleasant Street one way and have traffic turning on a cross street go just right, a right hand turn? I think there's a, there's a few things on the table. I think potentially one way, I think I think the bigger thing that's on the table potentially is just right turn only. Yeah, okay. And so if you if you want to go left, you'd have to take a right and go around the roundabout. Um, so that's that's probably the bigger uh, potential. Hi, Kathleen Nelson again. Um, you talked earlier about contaminated soil being trucked to New York. Can you talk a little bit about the contamination, what it is, where it came from? So I can give you a, a very general information on that because uh, that stuff's honestly kind of over my head as far as when say the hazmat people will get in, but I think Aaron can be a little more specific. Sure, so uh, contaminated soils, it's actually very light contamination. <laughs> Um, we've gone through, we've done a, a complete characterization of the site. There's been over, like 130 samples that have been tested throughout the rail corridor and the roadways. Um, and so it's non-hazardous, but it's contaminated. And so um, there's, uh, there's contaminants related to um, the gasoline spill that happened in, that was 97, and, um, sorry, 2007. And, um, other other contaminants that you typically see within a, within a railroad corridor are related to the ties, um, some of the pesticides that are sprayed there, um, that type of stuff. Hi, uh, Greg Cohn from Main Street Stationery. Uh, could you talk about the accessibility? Uh, I guess what I'm referring to is between. My understanding is that the the for traffic will be closed off from. Bakery Lane slash Rock Hall Road into the area of the construction. Um, it affects, affects my business in a way that I'm a FedEx ship center and people have to come in and drop off a lot of heavy packages during the day, ship things out, pick things up, whatever. Also, I was curious about what will happen at night for the restaurants. You know, maybe people wanted to drop off somebody who's handicapped at 8.30 at night. Um, What's the plan for controlling traffic flow in that area? So the plan is um, really to to limit, as you said, to limit the uh, vehicular access uh, starting right around Bakery Lane. Uh, so this is going to be close to um, close to through traffic, close to uh, kind of everyday traffic. Uh, there, are, there are provisions for deliveries to the businesses, so FedEx, we chatted about that a little bit earlier. Um, Kabriki will be allowing delivery vehicles through uh, to be able to get to the businesses. Would that include my customers? It will include FedEx. I'm a FedEx ship center. I have so, customers dropping off. So it'll, it'll include the FedEx trucks. No, that doesn't matter. I'm just saying, I have customers. There's no sense so in the truck will, if there's nothing to pick up or deliver. It will not include the customers. If a customer doesn't want to get there, they'll have to either take the shuttle, which we talked about. Was it 20, being 50 able to pound circulate. bike freight? I mean, I'm talking about things they have to drop off and ship. I think, I think um, it's either the shuttle, and, and I, I don't know. It sounds like something like that maybe is... is um, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I'm not, like not enough thought has been put into the needs of the local merchants. So, uh, sir, sure, I want to say that was something we didn't consider. So, I'd like to meet with you afterwards to talk about how we might be able to support that specific we need, which is a little bit different than maybe some of the other uh, the merchants in that area. So, if you could come over after this meeting's over, we'll get exchange contact information and see if there are things we can do to help okay. facilitate that. I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Uh, Steve Meyer, uh, just a quick suggestion again. Uh, another similar to the South Pleasant Street left turn restriction. Uh, I would also suggest that you do that at least during this 10 week closure period at the South Street intersection with Main Street. No, do not allow left hand turns at that point. It really backs things up sometimes even now. Uh, so again, people could turn right, go around the roundabout if they needed to go south on Route 30. I'm Michelle Butler, representing the Border Medical Center. I just want—I was just curious: are um, are there just going to be detour signs? Will there be special signage saying hospital detour, and will these signs be up for a while and then come down so it's not confusing, or will they stay up the whole time? So the detour signs will be be installed in advance of any coverage. They wouldn't be confusing for folks when there's not a detour, and then they would get in uncovered once the detour is in place um, and then the other signs would be covered so that um, the actual sign detour route is the only route that signs so there's not conflicting information. Um, and there will be specific signs saying hospital detour or just detour? I'm not familiar with the details of the traffic control package that, the, that our engineers put together but I can look into it to see if we have hospital specific signs. Um, if there are hospital signs out there now then we would make sure that we had hospital signs during the detour sign package. Thank you. Uh, hi, Nancy Dunn. Uh, I had a question that often in a project like this, you don't know what's working and what's not working as far as signage until the project begins. Is there, is this, is it uh, liquid enough that if we realize that certain signs about uh, where, where we're sending people, where they can park or go, uh, can be tweaked along the way pretty much right away if things are not working? Um, for traffic, for tourists? Yes, so uh, we are actually paying Ricky to have what we call an MMP crew for the duration of the closure, um, which is a designated crew to maintain signs that are knocked down or not working, add signs if we deem them necessary, necessary. We have a payment provision for signs, so we pay them for those. So uh, there's, there is a crew um, designated to making sure that this stuff is in place and functioning as it's intended. Um, and if it's not functioning as it's intended, we we have the flexibility and the, the, the ability to react quickly and, and try to move it. Thank you. I have one other question. Uh, there's parking behind our building in back, and that's where the people that work in the bank park, and that, uh, that um, is accessible to us. Will that be open? We, we have to get there now through the Marble Works into that rule. Yep, so you'll still have uh, to get to it through Marble Works, but it will still be open. Okay, great. Thank you. But just comment to uh, follow up on what Nancy talk about as far as observations on science that's confusing or anything like that. Um, that's Jim Gish's job as the conduit <laughs> for the town uh, in that, yeah, uh, maybe it was a correct choice of words, but if you have those, have those observations to make sure that they get to Jim, when we had the, the bridge closures, uh, those observations had us doing some some additional signage to try to clarify um, the path for pedestrians, etc. And so, if, um, you can make sure that I think everybody that's here must know and get the, the routine uh, email from Jim, and that's got his contact information on that. So, uh, he's he's kind of our lead conduit to the to the contractors, and that way the contractors are getting a unified. Um, vision from us. And if you're not, please sign up for his blog because he does put out a, a very informative uh, update on, on what's happened and what's going to be happening. Um, he works with us directly to get information from Kubricki and from our construction section to make sure that that's you know, accurate. Are there any other questions? We do have a closing segment that I'd like them to, to share um, just to talk about what the the final uh, project <coughs> punch list items are, and then some visuals that are pleasing to look at. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're primarily, uh, HB is going to go through the landscaping plan, but 
2021 will we'll start as soon as the, the winter season ends in 2021, um, depending <coughs> on what type of winter we get. Um, immediately you can get right back into final paving, landscaping, which would be your spring plantings, your final sidewalks, your walkways, your park um, finishes, benches, um, that type of stuff. And then clean up and final inspection by VTrans um, before we completely remove all of our equipment. Um, <laughs> um, so the impacts of 2021, um, we have to plant trees, we have to take deliveries of the, the plantings and all the trees, we have to take deliveries of the different um, finishes, benches, we're using, we're using some of the ashlar blocks to make seating and um, I call it handrails along the sidewalks and get to the different park areas. Um, all that stuff has to be brought into Triangle Park or Brothelogic Park for that. Um, so you're going to be down to smaller delivery trucks, um, regular sidewalk style construction. You won't have big cranes sitting in the, um, the area anymore and all your roads will have um, intermittent closures as deliveries need to be brought in um, or if a sidewalk needs to be poured. Um, there should be very little impact. In fact, a lot of good things to see when you see the plants go in and you see the pavers go in. And, that's probably a good set we over to Aaron to give you a visual of what that would look like. Okay, so um, this is kind of a, this is the result of the landscape uh, design planning that's happened over the, over the course of the past year. Last time we were in front of the public, uh, this was the the sketch that was um, put in front of the select board. Um, uh, I should say our, our director of land planning, Mark Hamlin. <coughs> led this effort. He couldn't be here tonight. He really wanted to. He was very excited about this project. He is very excited about this project. Um, so I'll, I'll try to get through what he wanted to talk about. Um, so this is the last, um, the hand sketch that you had seen with Main Street, Merchants Row, uh, re-established Triangle Park area connected to the Village Green, and then the Lazarus Park. Uh, so since this time, we've worked on developing uh, some renderings of, of what this is going to look like at the end. Uh, so a shot from uh, above the Battelle Block building with the, uh, the sidewalks re-established along Main Street and Merchants Row, the, the street trees um, that line, line the streets, the Ashland Blocks. Uh, we've got a prominent hardscaped area, a plaza space that is adjacent to both Main Street and Merchants Row, and then the grass uh, lawn area keeping with the historic nature of uh, that downtown setting. Um, just another uh, shot of the, uh, the rendering. A shot from Main Street looking towards Merchants Row um, and then looking into the Lazarus uh, Park area. Uh, so down Printer's Alley, got the re reconstructed Printer's Alley. Um, and a walkway that, that winds itself um, down to the bottom of Printer's Alley, uh, railroad tunnel, um, the exit of the railroad tunnel north of Main Street. And this is from the bottom of Printer's Alley looking back up toward Main Street. Um, uh, ADA accessible pathway that winds around uh, New Leinstone <coughs> Labyrinth, stairway, um, and then this would be the, the Printer's Alley at the bottom. With that, sort of back over to Brian. Aaron, the one thing you forgot to show in the photograph too is the expectation that at some point after this job there's going to be a passenger train in those photos. Eventually, yes. <laughs> so I want to thank our uh, participants in you know, doing the presentation. They're all from away from here. They came and spent their evening to uh, help us understand what the next two years are going to look like. I hope you share with me in the excitement of, of what that end product looks like. And I also want to thank, there's a lot of them here, there's our neighbors together who, who are doing so much to try to start to build some excitement to continue to bring people downtown for events, even when it's maybe not so convenient. Um, and my hope is that out of this, those events are sustaining and we continue to build the activities in that beautiful downtown that we end up with. So thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate uh, your participation in the town and, and uh, hopefully we can all get through this.